test. Okay, so um, on Friday I gave a complete proof of Gauss's law of quadratic reciprocity modulo uh, several statements about Gauss sums, which I did not prove. The goal right now is to prove all of those statements. If you completely missed Friday or don't remember anything from Friday, you'll still be able to understand everything I'm going to say today because um, these are really just some, you just won't care as much as you should care if you're here on Friday. That's the only difference. Okay. So recall what this idea of Gauss sums is. We're going to fix for the rest of today an odd prime p. And then for every integer a, I defined or Gauss defined a complex number g sub a, which is the following sum. The sum n equals 1 to p minus 1, the Legendre symbol a on p, zeta sub p to the power of a, where I'm not going to hear uh, zeta sub p, which I also just call zeta, is e to the 2 pi i over p, which is cosine of 2, I mean, it's a p through degree. This is what it is. So, cosine 2 pi over p plus i sine 2 pi over p. So this is a complex number. And then I made um, several statements, a couple of uh, propositions, propositions 0, 1, and 2, about this sum. And I didn't prove any of them. And what I plan to do right now is completely prove them. OK? So that's what we're doing. I left out the n on this side. Oops. I left out the n. So the zetas are supposed to run through the powers, uh, or the term here runs through the powers of zeta to the a, and here you run through a, and that's actually the crap. Why did I erase this one? Yeah. Actually, defining correctly. Yes, exactly the way it is. So here's the Gauss sum. It's the sum as n goes from one to p minus one of the symbol n on p. So you're running through all the possible Legendre symbols. Zeta to the power of a n. So basically, if you think about it, the only difference between these different Gauss sums is that you're making a different choice of n of p through to the unity. These different zeta to the a's, um, well, for p not dividing a, there's kind of two situations, p dividing a and p not dividing a, but for p not dividing a, the only difference between these is you're making a different choice of p root of unity. And for p dividing a, these are all one. So let's prove the first. I'm going to prove a couple of lemmas, which I didn't mention before, but they'll make it easier to <coughs> the propositions that I did mention before. So the first one, um, so for any a and z, the sum, this thing goes from 0 to p minus 1 of zeta to the power of a n. So this is not the Gauss sum. It's just something that will be useful. is either p or 0. This is, this is not at all a Gauss sum, but we're going to end up considering a big, scary-looking sum. See? And knowing this ahead of time will make it much easier to simplify. Okay? So um, this is really easy. It's a statement for, let's see, for p dividing a and for p not dividing a. Oops. Dividing a and p not dividing a. So uh, first, when p divides a, this is zeta to the power of p times n. Zeta to the power of p is just 1, because e to the 2 pi i is 1. And so this is just p copies of 1 to the power of n. So the top thing is clear. So the proof, um, when p divides a, it's just sum of n equals 0 to p minus 1, 1 to the power of n, which is equal to p. Done. Now p doesn't divide a, we're just going to use an identity, namely that x to the n minus 1 is x minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus dot dot plus 1. And then if you rewrite this by dividing both sides by x minus 1, you get that. And I guess we're going to apply it when, uh, actually, I mean, we're going to apply this for p rather than n, so maybe I should write p. 
So it's an identity, I mean, for any exponent at all, polynomial to the power of p minus 1 is x minus 1 times this other one. Just multiply it out, it works. So now this means that x to the p minus 1, x to the p minus 1 divided by x minus 1 is x to the p minus 1 plus data plus x plus 1. Okay, and now you just substitute zeta to the power of a in for x on both sides. So on this side, you get the sum that we're talking about. So here you get um, sum n equals 0 to p minus 1 zeta to the a to the n. So I'm just replacing x by zeta to the power of a. And on the other side, you get zeta to the a p minus 1 over zeta to the a minus 1. The denominator is not 0 because we're assuming that a is not a multiple of p. But the numerator is 0 because we're assuming that, well, not assuming anything, it's just zeta to the power of p is already 1. So when you subtract 1 minus 1, you get 0. So over here, you get 0. On the other hand, you get the sum that we were talking about, which proves the limit. OK, so we have this sum. Yes? Why is it to e to a 2 i? 2 pi i over two pi, p. Why is it e to a 2 pi i is a, is a 1? Uh, why is e to the, OK, so in general, e to the 2 pi i theta <coughs> is cosine of theta plus i sine theta. So, uh, just write that one. I think yeah. it's okay. Sorry. E to the i theta is cos theta plus i sine theta. Okay? And um, if you then put 2 pi in, e to the, so take theta equal to 2 pi, then this is cosine of 2 pi plus i times sine of 2 pi. That is 1. So if you believe this identity, then that's why uh, e to the 2 pi i is 1. Um, but in order to believe this identity, really, all you, you'd have to know, you know the definition of the complex exponential and a few basic properties about it. I don't know. Shouldn't you guys know this sort of stuff? It's like fourth year math students. So that's why. Right. Good. Um, all right. So here we are. So that's number one. And I'm just going to record it really small right here because I have to use that space. And it's just the sum zeta to the a n is equal to p or 0. And it's p if p divides a. And it's not. It's 0 if p doesn't divide a. Just record stuff over here that we're going to use later. All right, and then another lemma, which is really easy given the lemma we just proved, so I'll just write it out right here. Lemma two, sum uh, n equals zero to p minus one data to the power of x minus y times n is equal to p or zero. It's p if x is congruent to y mod n. And it's 0 if x is not congruent to y. It's almost exactly the same statement. Just a statement for any integers x and y, that's true. It's just a trivial application of the previous lemma. But we're going to use that lemma 2 in the evaluation of that big sum. All right, now let's do something that involves Gauss sums, finally. We have another lemma. g sub 0 is equal to 0. OK? So this is the first time we're actually going to prove anything about Gauss sums. And it's not too hard. We just compute it. So what is the definition of g sub 0? It's the sum as n goes from 1 to p minus 1, n on p, and then zeta to the a n, but a is 0. So all of these terms are just 1. And so we can just write it down. This is sum n equals 1 to p minus 1 n on p, that Legendre symbol. And now, here's how you can figure out what this is equal to. Well, what happens is half the time you get plus 1 and half the time you get minus 1. And 
uh, more precisely, we're summing over every single element mod p. And remember when we um, used the fact that fp star is cyclic to show that the Legendre symbol n over p is, um, we proved that n over p is congruent to n to the power of p minus 1 over 2 mod p by using that the uh, <coughs> fp star is a cyclic group. And we did that by taking an element, um, and we, we proved this by taking an element g that's a generator, or fp star, and we considered the powers of it, and the even powers of it were exactly, or the squares were exactly the even powers of g, where the exponent is taken modulo p minus 1, and the non-squares are exactly the odd powers of g. And p minus 1 being an even number, if you look in the interval from uh, I guess 1 to p minus 1 inclusive, then exactly half of those numbers are even and half of them are odd. And so exactly half of the numbers are squares and exactly half of them aren't. So if you write out this sum down here, you get a bunch of plus ones, um, a whole bunch of plus ones, half of them, and then you get a bunch of minus ones. I mean, not in order, but in some order that's what you get. So that's zero. So it's just because, I mean, half of them are g squared on p, it's g to the fourth on p, etc. And then over here you have g on p, g cubed on p, etc. I'm completely avoiding using any group theory. If you use group theory, then it's just the fact that the subgroup of squares is an index to subgroup of any cyclic group. And that's how you do this in one sentence with group theory. Okay, so that one is done, which we'll call lemma three in my notes. So I'll write that right here. Lemma three, g sub zero is always what? Zero. Okay, that's done. And now, let's move pretty quickly, to prove a proposition. <coughs> this was one of the things that we used in a critical way in our proof of quadratic reciprocity, and that's that for any A, um, the Gauss sum g sub a is equal to the Legendre symbol a on p times g sub 1. So remember, this played a big role in the proof on Friday. And we just proved this, I think, when a is equal to 0, or a is divisible by p, because when a is divisible by p, so this only depends on a, this sum only depends on a modulo p, because zeta has multiplicative order p. So you can always reduce this exponent modulo p, and you get exactly the same thing. Um, zeta to the power of p is equal to 1. So uh, proof, if p divides a, then it's really just the same as g0. g0 is, of course, is it equal to the symbol 0 on p times g1? Well. By definition of the Legendre symbol, 0 on p is just 0. So this is 0. We just proved that g0 is 0. So that's done. And now the fun part is the other one. That was kind of an easy special case. Um, now let's do if p doesn't divide a. Okay, if p doesn't divide a, then let's just sort of consider what, what this says. So g sub a is, now we just write down the definition. Sum n equals 1 through p minus 1 n on p zeta to the a n. Okay, so that's what it is. On the other hand, let's consider this product a on p g1. So that's a on p now sum n equals 1 to p minus 1 zeta sub or it's to the power of n, because a is just 1. Okay, just writing down this and writing down that. And now, uh, oh, I forgot, g1 has n on p. It looks a little messy, so I'm going to rewrite that. So the sum as n goes from 1 through p minus 1, the symbol n on p, zeta to the power of n. Okay, so they, uh, they don't look obviously the same. It's kind of annoying actually, because 
Here you only have an A on the outside. Here you have know, this A kind of stuck in the inside. But look what you can do. If you just, if you're going to use that the Legendre symbol is a homomorphism, which follows from this identity that we, this formula that we proved before, that used the FP star cyclic. And so what you can do is rewrite this as sum n equals 1 to p minus 1 a times n upon p, say that to the n. Must have made a mistake. All right. Ah. Um. Proof that's, I proved it differently here. It's just, I'm trying to change this proof into the proof I have here. Um, these are just true statements, but they're not exactly the right thing. Um, so, uh, so the way I did it in my notes is just consider instead a on p g a, and then I prove that this is equal to g one, just by simplifying. It's actually an easier approach. So let's just do that instead. So you have A on P, G, A, that's A on P. It just comes out to be nicer. So you get sum N equals 1 to P minus 1. And then um, G sub A, that's the sum right here. And now we're going to multiply it by A on P. And so you just get to write it as the sum A, N on P, let's say it to be A, N. OK? And now look, A is co-prime to P. So in the exponent here, and also in the Legendre symbol, when you take all the numbers from 1 up to p minus 1 and multiply them through by something that's co-prime to p, you just permute them around modulo p, uh, modulo p. So everything's happening modulo p here. Because zeta has order p, and the Legendre symbol, all that matters is this number modulo p. And so this is exactly the same as the sum n equals 1 through p minus 1, n on p, zeta to the n. These are the same because a permutes around the numbers modulo p, because a is co-prime to p. So that's the trick right here. It's actually an incredibly common trick that pops up in proving things all over the place. So the trick is that a permutes the numbers mod p. And that's because multiplication by a permutes them because they're because it's uh, invertible, and hence what you're doing is you're summing up exactly the same numbers in both sums, just in a different order, and so it's the same thing. Okay, so that uh, actually proves it because this is g1. It's just writing it in a different way, and also this is this number on the left is plus or minus one, so you can put it on the other side, and it actually works. Boom, you get the ga is a on pg1. Because this is plus or minus one. It doesn't matter which side I put it on. So let me record this statement. Um, just position two. And that's that G A is A on P G one. Any questions about that? Now finally, proposition one, which was the um, Formula for GA squared. And that's all we have left to prove. GA squared, this was the, I think, the most surprising one of all. It says that GA squared is some sine times P. That is, that GA is like a square root of P. So that was the statement GA squared is minus 1 to the P minus 1 over 2 times uh, P. And this was the main thing by far that was most important in proving quadratic reciprocity. Okay, so let's prove proposition one. So remember, everything is the same as before. P is an odd prime. Right. 
erase a few things. But it's a pretty fun proof. It's pretty surprising that it works, I think. Um, so proof of proposition one. <coughs> so what we're going to do is we're going to take a sum involving these G sub A's, and we're going to evaluate it in two very different ways. And one will be really easy and one will be hard, but when we compare the two, we'll get an equality, and that equality will immediately imply this proposition. Okay? But it's crazy, I mean, who would ever think that the following is the thing to consider? The sum, as A goes from 0 to P minus 1, G sub A times G sub minus A. Let's just evaluate that ridiculous looking thing in two separate ways. So evaluate this in two ways. And we'll get two different things. Okay, so here's how we do it. So let's see. Uh, let's first do the easy way, and then we'll do the hard way over there. So the easy way is just to use proposition two. We'll write everything there in terms of G sub one and a Legendre symbol. And the Legendre symbols, I mean, it's going to be A on P and minus A on P. And so that's just going to like end up with a minus one, and then an A on P squared. Things simplify. It's really easy. So let's do the easy way. So in other words, use proposition two. Okay, so here's what you get. Um, sum as A goes from zero to P minus one, G A, G minus A, is A on, oops, don't forget the sum sign, sum A equals zero to P minus one, and then this product is, let's see, we just literally just use that, so we get uh, A on P, G sub one times minus A on P, G sub one. Is that, um, okay, but look, I mean, this is just begging to simplify a lot. This is equal to the sum A equals zero to P minus one. Um, use the, the symbol something on P as a homomorphism. So this is minus one on P, A on P squared, G one squared. So we should be happy we see a G1 squared, because after all, the proposition's about you know, something squared. And um, there's really no difference between G1 squared and GA squared because of this right here. They have GA and G1 only differ by a sign. So good shape there. Oh, this is, of course, or A not divisible by P. Otherwise, this would just be 0. Because G0 is 0. Okay, so that's really good that we see this, since this is exactly the same as GA squared. This is just 1, because the symbol is plus or minus 1, uh, except I mean, when A equals 0. So let me, uh, let me put a 1 here, So because when A is 0, it's just 0. Okay, and then minus 1 on P, there's a formula for that, and it's this right here, because uh, look how the Legendre symbol works. So this is equal to sum as a goes from 1 to p minus 1 of minus 1 to p minus 1 over 2 times g1 squared. And that is easy because this doesn't even depend on a. So it's just p minus 1 times minus 1 to the p minus 1 over 2 um, times g1 squared. Okay, so that's what it is. Good. And now I'm going to evaluate this same thing in a completely different way using, so here what I did is I used proposition 2. Now I'm going to evaluate it just using the definition and using these other lemmas I mentioned earlier. And I'll just expand everything out like crazy. Use these lemmas, which basically are, you kind of think of them as orthogonality relations between Gaussians. Um, so we'll use those lemmas, and we'll end up getting a completely different expression, such will not, will be somewhat different, and then when we equate the two and cancel, this is what we get. All right, so that's the easy way. Let me show you the hard way. Okay. 
So I'm going to do the uh, I'm going to do the easy version the hard way, then I'll do the hard version the hard way. So sum a equals zero to p minus one g a g minus a equals dot 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 equals dot 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 equals dot 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 equals p times p minus one. So if I were to fill in the dots, then you get that these two are equal. Actually, sorry, yeah, that's right. So these two are equal, and canceling the p minus one, we get exactly the claim. And you just pull the minus one to the other side. Okay, so I actually have to fill in the dots, right? Because that's everything. But if I compute this and I end up with that, p, p minus one, we're completely done. We've given from first principles a complete proof of Gauss's law of quadratic reciprocity. Okay? So let's see if we can do it. That's all that remains. So here's how we do it. Just a equals sum a equals zero to p minus one g a p minus a equals, and then you just just gets ridiculous. You use the definition of sum a equals zero to p minus one, and then uh, g a is sum n equals one to p minus one symbol n on p zeta to the a n times sum n equals one to p minus one symbol n on p zeta to the minus a on uh, to zeta to the minus a n. Okay, and now let's just simplify this pretty big sum. So I'll leave the sum a equals zero to p minus one on the outside, and then here. I'm going to distribute, so I'll write this as sum n equals 1 to p minus 1, and I better not use n now, I better use m here, it's confusing, so I'll change that to an m. Sum n equals 1 to p minus 1, sum m equals 1 to p minus 1, and then, as if this was a homomorphism, so write it as nm on p, zeta to the an minus am. Okay? So just sums. I like calculus except easier. And now uh, a few simplifications. So the first thing to observe is that so why did I keep this? Oh, my notes better do this. I kept this separate. 